Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Susan. I'm Curator of Education here at the Museum of Glass. And it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Walt, who's just walking off the hot shop floor, but he'll be back in a minute, I'm sure, <laughs> to do a wonderful talk on the history of glass. And this is um, a culminating event, actually, of Goblet Week, our first annual Goblet Week. And we've been making fabulous goblets all week, featuring a variety of very distinguished artists here. And we took a lot of footage, so if you missed out, it will be on YouTube at some point soon. Um, and it's well worth watching, because um, it's really, really hard to make these Venetian-style goblets. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Walt who I consider to be a foundation American studio glass artist. Um, he's been working in this field for over 40 years. He started at the Massachusetts College of Art in Boston. And he, of course, as you know, is our fabulous MC here in our hot shop. And we are so lucky to have him with the amount of expertise and experience that he has. And you might not know this, but Walt is also helping our curatorial department. He's going through every object in our collection and making little notes and writing down stories if he knows them. And um, it's going to be a wealth of information. So Walt, as well as working here, um, is a frequenter of the Pilchuck Glass School, where he's been a scholar and artist in residence. He has taught glass and painting at Penland and Haystack. He has given workshops in England, Sweden, and Mexico, and he's internationally known as a glass painter. His work is in a variety of collections, inc including ours here um, in Tacoma, uh, the Corning Museum of Glass, and the Montreal Museum of Glass as well, of, of Museum of Fine Arts as well. And his artwork can be found at the Traver Gallery. And there's so much more to say about Walt. <laughs> but we are so delighted that, that you're here. His lectures are very, very special. And um, we're filming this, too. So Walt, may I give you the mic? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Everybody hear me? Yeah, OK, good. Okay, so as Susan said, this has been Goblet Week. We've been making all sorts of goblets. I love goblets. What I'm going to show you today is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more, but hopefully uh, you'll see some of these things that will uh, get you excited, and you'll look into it more and learn a little more about goblets and glass. Goblets, glass goblets are always a kind of a special glass. Um, you use them for, if you use them for drinking things like champagne, you don't really use them for things like drinking grape juice. So uh, they're always on a little bit on the special side. They're extremely difficult to make. Um, there are so many ways these things can go wrong. Uh, for many glass blowers, Glass uh, making goblets has proved to be kind of a proof of and challenge to their skills. So uh, a lot of the glass uh, artists that we had this week, their main artwork is very different from the goblets. But they always like to, uh, it's kind of like a sport to them to try and refine. It's like being uh, Michael Jordan and playing golf. You really, it's always pretty hard, and you want to be better and better at it. So starting in 1979, a number of Venetian masters came to the United States, particularly to the Pilchuck School here in the Northwest, and began teaching the young Americans how to blow glass. Up to that point, most of the American glass blowers were self-taught. They had lots of energy, lots of ideas but very little skills. The Venetians brought the thousand years of traditional goblet making here to America. And uh, for about the last 50 years, 
it's become a thing among American glassblowers to try and master these skills. The goblet form is very old, but only sort of relatively recently have they been made out of glass. This is a, a ceramic goblet from India. It dates to 1300 BC. Now, so there's lots of goblets uh, that are very early, but they're usually ceramic or metal or stone. This is an Egyptian goblet. It's made out of a material called faience. Faience is a material that's sort of halfway between glass and ceramics. So it's molded like ceramics and put in a fire. The, the faience vitrifies and becomes a sort of glassy solid. This is uh, about 600 BC. These are some terracotta goblets from uh, the Etruscans. These date from about 500 BC. So you see, you can recognize the goblet form, but you're still not getting around to actually making any glass goblets. So a lot of, uh, a lot of things that are made in glass are based on uh, examples from other crafts, ceramics, metals, etc. This is one of the earliest examples I could find of a glass goblet. This is Roman. This is uh, maybe, oh, fourth, fifth century AD. Uh, there's a lot of glass, uh, Roman glass. It's mostly jugs, uh, cosmetic containers, pitchers, bottles, but very, very few goblets. This was one of the only ones I could find. After the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the center of glassmaking kind of moved to the Middle East. So this is a, a goblet from about 800 AD. And uh, we think it comes from either Iraq or Syria. And it's kind of, one of uh, modeled after one of those boots you'd see like in Aladdin or Arabian Nights with the little pointy curly toes. Um, these are also some Islamic goblets. These um, date from uh, about 1000 AD. Now, goblets weren't very popular in the Middle East, I think a great deal because most goblets are associated with alcoholic drinking, and the Islamic tradition prohibits the uh, drinking of alcohol. So we're really not going to see the goblets take off until the Venetians take over. This is a kind of goblet called a Romer. Uh, it was made sort of in the Middle Ages in Europe. And those kind of bumpy little uh, additions on the side are called prunts. And they served a special function. At this time in Europe, in say 1000, 1100 AD, people ate meat with their hands. So their hands were always greasy. And so in order for them to grip the goblet, they had these little prunts, and that gave them a little uh, friction. In 1200, Venice comes to the rescue for goblets. The Venetians first fled to the uh, Venetian lagoon to escape from invading tribes from Asia and Germanic tribes. The lagoon was swampy. It was. Uh, mosquito infested, and uh, they thought, what's the absolute worst place you could go that no one, even Attila the Hun, would follow you? And they said, ah, the Venetian Lagoon. And they didn't follow them there. So they started to set up a shop on the islands. And because they were island-living people, they started to uh, develop a maritime culture. And it turns out that that maritime culture became a huge boon, and they became the, the middlemen between Europe and Asia. So they would, they would deal with all the trades. They'd get spices and cloth from Asia, sell it to Europeans, get manufactured goods, sell it to the Asians. And so they became very wealthy. They had a huge trading network. Venice at that time was uh, really an empire more than an island. They had 
uh, property all up and down the uh, Adriatic coast in Greece and Crete. And so they were a big deal. Uh, in 1271, they set up a guild for making glass. They had special rules. They, um, for example, they could, you couldn't import any foreign glass to Venice, and no one outside of Venetian natives was allowed to make glass in Venice. The Venetians refined the techniques of glass blowing. They became the best glass blowers in the world. They dominated sophisticated glass making from about the late 1200s to the 1600s. They had two claims to fame. One was their pure and simple designs, mostly based on the inherent uh, process of glass blowing. You can see on this beauty there, it's simple, it's uh, elegant. The other was they invented a special glass called Cristallo. They called it Cristallo because it was supposed to be so clear and beautiful that it looked like rock crystal. Rock crystal was a, a semi-precious stone which they made religious objects out of and very elegant type of things. And was, the crystal is said to have very special properties. It was said that if you drank poison out of a crystal goblet, that the goblet would, that would render the poison harmless. So that's a good selling point if you lived in Renaissance Europe. They also mastered enameling on glass. This is a wedding goblet. These goblets were commissioned uh, on aristocrats' weddings. So one side of the goblet would have some kind of mythological or symbolic scene on one side, and the opposite side, they'd have a portrait of the couple. And uh, as I said earlier, glass was always used to imitate other materials. So the big colored blobs on the goblet on the left were meant to imitate jewels in a goblet that was like jewel encrusted. So the one on the right is onyx and gold, and it's uh, various stones inset into the gold uh, framework. And the goblet on the left is all glass, but the inspiration for those uh, jewels it comes from the uh, metal goblet. So with all their uh, trade network and their skills, they became the best glass blowers in the world and the most prolific producers of goblins. This is a classic Venetian goblet from the 1500s. It uses uh, a decoration called Zamfirico. Um, it's rods of glass that have a twisted design in them. They're melted into a bubble, and they make twisted fancy stripes. And we have a little diagram up here. This shows you how we make the Zamfirico cane. We lay out some rods of white glass. We roll a cylinder of clear glass over that. The right rods stick to the clear glass cylinder, and then we stretch it and twist it at the same time, and we end up with the bottom, the, what we call the Zamfirico cane. And so here's a Venetian goblet, 1500s. You can see the Zamfirico on one side. And you can also see a Venetian goblet where they imitated the cane patterns with glass enamel. So all those things on the right side we're painted on with a brush. On the left side, it's actual glass. Another decorative technique they used in goblets was called reticello. Reticello is probably one of the hardest, fanciest uh, designs in glass. It's a crisscross design, and at each intersection where the, the glass canes cross, there's a little tiny bubble in the center. Ready in Italian means net, and uh, the Italians thought that the reticello looked like the little bubbles coming through a fishing net. And so that's what, what they called it, reticello. 
And this is how the reticello is made. You make two bubbles out of cane, out of rods of glass. One bubble you twist to the right. One bubble you twist to the left. And then you blow one inside the other. And if you look at my fingers, imagine these are rods of glass. Each place where they cross, there's a little tiny space in there between my fingers that traps some air. And when you heat that up, that becomes a little bubble at each intersection. So you can see the pattern, resulting pattern, up in the corner of the drawing. Probably the most elaborate of all the Venetian goblets are the dragon goblets. You've probably seen some of those made this week uh, with Mr. Mongrain. Uh, so glass was all the rage in Europe uh, among the upper classes. It was also very expensive. Uh, pretty soon, the, Venetian, the, the European nobles figured out that it was easier to buy a Venetian than it was to buy Venetian glass. So one by one, they lured Venetian glass blowers out of Venice to France, to Sweden, to England, set up their own factories, and made the glass in their own countries. So on the left, there's a uh, Dutch glass made in the Venetian tradition, but that's a Venetian glass blower working in the Netherlands. On the right is a Swedish glass, once again, a Venetian glass blower working in Sweden. Eventually, in these other countries, uh, after they, they kind of absorbed the technology from the Venetians, then they started to make their own uh, indigenous styles. But early on, uh, they made things just like they made in Venice, and it was called façon de Venice, which means in the fashion of Venice. The Venetian glass sort of went out of style in the 1600s, and the kind of uh, heavy carved glass from Central Europe became the thing. You can see this is a Czech goblet. This is a, uh, a German goblet. It's cut and enameled. At the end of the 1800s, uh, the uh, British got in the game, and they made some cool stuff. I love this little stem with that little twist in the middle. In 1797, Napoleon conquered Venice and nearly killed the glass industry. The French and the Austrians fought over Venice, and glass making went pretty much to a halt. In 1860, 1861, the uh, French were fought back and Italy formed the Italy that we know today. So all the little city-states, Milan, uh, Venice, uh, Firenze, uh, Florence, they all joined together and made uh, what we today call Italy. And uh, in that new Italy, there was an a, a, uh, entrepreneur called Antonio uh, Salviati, and he formed a glass company, and he was determined that he would revive the uh, traditions of Venetian glass. So these are all Salviati pieces, and they're all based on uh, sort of elaborate, uh, elaborate recreations of traditional Venetian glass. Another company that was uh, very crucial in restoring the glass industry was the Barovier Company, and this is a glass from 1895. And uh, when you're presented with glass with the same tools and uh, same processes, everybody sort of comes up sometimes with similar ideas. So the idea of putting some weird little thing in the middle of your goblet stem, it happens to everybody who ever learns to blow glass. 
This is a, uh, a wedding cup by Fritz Hecker, a Czech uh, glassmaker. And it's hinged at the top. I don't know if any of you could help me out. Why would that glass, little glass at the top be hinged? I haven't been able to figure that out. So the, the body is metal. The cup at the top is glass. It's enameled. And the skirt is enameled. But anyway, I thought it was an interesting piece. These are some glasses by... Uh, Carl Koping, Kerping. He's a, a designer. He worked with a scientific glass blower, Fred Zietzman. And Carl designed the glass, and Mr. Zietzman actually made the models. So you can see one of the glasses. And these, these glasses were flame worked. They weren't made from the furnace. They were made over a table-mounted torch, starting with pre-made rods and tubes just like you see uh, flame work today. Another approach to goblets was Lewis Comfort Tiffany. We all know Tiffany lamps, Tiffany windows. These are what he calls his floriform goblets. And uh, they're very Art Nouveau. They have the sort of based on the forms that you would see in a plant, like a tulip or a little, uh, something like that. This is by uh, uh, Fratelli Toso, the Fr Toso Brothers. This is one of my favorites. Very interesting stem. In the early 1900s, uh, there was a movement in uh, Austria called uh, the Vienna Secession, and they, were, they set up an organization called the Wiener Werkstatt, the, uh, the uh, Vienna workshop. And they designed uh, glass and various other crafts, metals, woods, fabrics. And they usually had them made somewhere else. So these glasses were made in Czech Republic, but designed by Viennese artists. On the left is Otto Prucher. On the right is the architect, Joseph Hopp. These are also Joseph Hoffman de designed glass and then decorated by various uh, female glass painters. Uh, glass painting was considered to be a female art. And so uh, Hoffman worked with uh, a woman called Vali Wiesentier to make these, decorate these uh, cups. 1921, uh, Paolo Vanini and Giacomo Capellini started a company called Vanini in uh, Murano. And they were intent on not only reviving glassmaking, but also making it modern. And so they went back and they looked at a bunch of uh, Renaissance paintings, and they looked at the glassware that was in the Renaissance paintings and they use that as their inspiration for their designs. There's a very famous vase. We have an example over here called the Veronese vase. And that was modeled after a vase that's in a painting by Paolo Veronese. It's called the Annunciation, and it's in the uh, Academia in, in Florence. And so this vase is kind of just sitting on a little side uh, rail in the painting. The painting is huge. So there's just a little thing there. And that's where the design comes from. Can we take off the uh, caption? There. So these are from Sweden. This is 1920s. On the left, oh, well, both on the left and right are goblets by Simone Gatte. On the left is one of my favorite goblets, the palace glass. And on the right is a glass uh, for the Sandvik factory. These are a classic uh, 1920s. It's called the Queen Margarita. 
I'm not sure who did the first design. You'll see it made by a bunch of people. But Queen Margherita was the first queen of Italy, the new Italy that came in the 1860s. These are the ambassador glasses by Oswald Hartel, who worked for Mosier, 1924. Very unusual. These are bimini glasses. These are also flame worked. There was a, uh, uh, a flame worker, Fritz Lample, who worked in Austria. He was up until the time when the Nazis came. He was Jewish. Got chased out of uh, out of Austria and went set up shop in London. But these are all done flame worked over a torch. Now we're in America, 1927, when uh, a small glass company, Consolidated Glass in Pennsylvania, hired a uh, Cubist sculptor by the name of Reuben Haley to design a whole range of glasswork. And so these were all mold blown. They were uh, a great artistic success and a terrible financial failure. So, but now, today, you'll see them in museums all over the world, but they didn't do so well in stores. This is Unusual Pieces by Guido Basalmo uh, Stella for Pauli and C, 1928. And this, is, this strikes me because it, um, it looks so modern. If you saw this in an exhibition of modern glass blowers, you wouldn't blink an eye. But this is all, you know, almost 100 years ago. These are also by uh, Bassamo Stella, 1930. This is by Tommaso Buzzi for Vanini. And uh, this is a special one for the glass blowers in the crowd, if they can figure out how these were made. I don't know, do we have any glass blowers? Want to take a guess? No volunteers? Okay. So this is 1937, Art Deco. Uh, Ludvika Smirakova, the Czech glass artist. This is another one of my favorites. This is Baccarat, the French glass company. Sometimes the simplest things are the best. These are some whimsical glasses for Vanini. Uh, cornet glasses, they're called. They're supposed to be horns, the glass horns, by Piero Fornicetti. This is a uh, what's called a the uh, Filigrana de Tapio. Tapio Vercola was a Finnish designer who went to work at Vanini. And uh, when he was at Vanini, he worked with the Venetian techniques that, that were you know, prevalent at the factory. Filigrana is the Italian name for cane, for the single striped uh, designs in glass. So they called it Filigrana de Tapio because it was his uh, take on the filigrana designs. This is a, a Swedish, Niels Lonberia, Swedish designer, 1950s. We have the original drawing, and you can see the glass on the left. These are some spring cups up in the upper left-hand corner. Is some cups made by uh, Bagley, which is an English firm. And then on the right, we have cups made by our own Northwest Buster Simpson, if you guys are familiar with him, made at the Pilchuck School. Uh, Buster Simpson cups were made with real uh, bed springs. So they were the springs that, that they took out of mattresses. This is one another another one of my favorites. It's a Dick Marcus colored cup, and 
So he's, he, the, the bowl of the goblet is just a solid piece of glass. It was a solid chunk of glass called cullet. And the stem is a traditional air twist. It's a uh, very traditional English decoration. But there's something cool about it. These are some uh, goblets designed by uh, Dante Marioni, who we had there this week. These were his designs for Stuben. Stuben went through a series of hiring uh, low contemporary glass artists. And apparently, these did very well, but Stuben did not survive. Um, they've since closed. Oops. One more. This is uh, James Mongrain, who we had here as one of our guests on Thursday. This is his take on the uh, dragon goblets. These are a collection, a co collaboration between James Mongrain and myself. These are floating uh, martini glasses for drinking martinis in the bathtub. And so they came in, in sort of uh, three parts. So we have the, the glasses, which were just sat in there with gravity. Then we had the float. And then we had a little stand so that when you could get out of the, the bath gracefully and place them in the stand. So me and Jim had, this was 1998, so quite a ways ago. This is uh, also by me, 1980s. This is my rock crystal. I made these as a demonstration for John uh, James Houston, the Stuben designer. He didn't uh, think it was too funny, but I did. So, and this is the tulip glass by Niels Landberia. This is going to be our demonstration this afternoon. These are made in a very different way than all the Venetian glass blowing that you've seen uh, up to this point. All of our guests have been sort of Venetian-style glass blowers. And so this has a very, uh, a very different uh, method. And you'll see it as we make it. But uh, there's a little funny story that goes with this. Is uh, We were going to make it for a lecture. And I wrote to a, a Swedish master, Jan Erik Rietzman, about to get instructions on how to make this glass. Because it's not really obvious when you look at it how it's made. And so he wasn't too uh, confident in his English. So he wrote the instructions in Swedish and then put them in Google Translate. <laughs> and when I got the email with the instructions, it made absolutely no sense at all. And I was going, oh my god, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this? So I, I told him, Jan Eric, I said, just send me the Swedish, and I'll send it to all my Swedish friends, and somebody will translate it for me. So finally, Ulrika heidman Valin, she saw the email. She translated it stuff we could understand. And we ended up making these glasses for our demonstration. So that's it. Thank you for your time and attention. If anybody has any questions. I hope you found something in there that you found interesting. Yeah. Oh, people bought some. Um, my brother has some. Me and Jim had a show at uh, the Traver Gallery in Seattle. And we made uh, 24 different designs. And we made these kind of, uh, kind of aquarium pedestals. So we showed them all the glasses floating. And we sold some. We lost a bunch of them in the earthquake, the Seattle earthquake. Do you remember that? But uh, they were all over the place. Well, thank you for your time. We're going to probably take a few minutes for lunch and then uh, back to the glass blowing.